So our colleague Sharice is like such an interesting and prescient reporter mm -hmm. who has an amazing sensibility for kind of knowing what is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes a little bit of work to be like, wait, why are we talking about the Safe Third Country Act or why are we talking about food banks? And that's a silly question to ask now because there's been so much reporting about food banks, but there wasn't when we did the story. Mm -hmm. But as with medically assisted dying, she was early to this and it was a process. I remember making this episode where converting uh, a, a lot of conversations about policy and policy failures into like a, an episode of a news podcast Ultimately, all this reporting had been done, and the way we cracked this episode was by throwing the script away and having a conversation about it. That was my favorite part of the episode, mm -hmm. is that kind of conversational style structure. What was really fascinating for me was just learning as almost the recent history of food banks in Canada and how they were a fairly recent invention and how it stuck around and became institutionalized. And this is not the fault of the food banks themselves. The food banks will pretty much invariably tell you they wish they were not yeah. needed. But how it's essentially about how the government has managed to privatize or outsource to individuals things that should be government functions in terms of And then co-op them for optics. Yeah. And, then, exactly. and make them into photo ops. You exactly. Know? And not but really, yeah. It was a good collaboration, though, because, you know, sometimes my ignorance is a gift to everyone. Yeah. Because of eventually the way that I think the episode worked was I'm like, I don't get this episode. Explain this to me. Why are we looking at, f and then that was the episode. And then Therese kind of broke it down for me. And then it's the most gratifying thing when the episode that you think like, well, like maybe we're doing good work here, but I don't know if anyone's going to care, becomes the episode that everybody listens to. And this was one of our, I think it might have been the biggest episode of the year. So this happens sometimes where we're working on something and, oh, this, you know, the CBC gets to it first while we're working on it. Like, darn it. And the CBC will often do a really good job. But we also know that we can maybe do a better job or at least a more engaging job and try to reach people that in ways that they, in the ways that they wouldn't. We did a better job. We Here did. is the Food Bank Industrial Complex by Cherie Suturin. I've mentioned this before, but when I get to work each morning, I have a choice. There's two different routes I could take. I can either take Harvard or I can take college. It doesn't matter whether I'm on a Harvard or college. Once I pass Borden Street on either of those streets, Harvard or college, past Borden, I hit a bread line every morning. On Harvard Street, there's literally a line of people waiting in the cold for bread. For bread. But it's not what you think. Um, this is a fancy artisanal boutique bakery. The bread there costs $13.50 a loaf. I bet it's good, though. It better be good. They're lined up in the cold to get a loaf of bread. This is a bakery that has instructions on their website for the proper way to slice a loaf. Okay, this is the best, this is the fanciest bread, and people, they, they love it. They, they, they are lined up in the cold, and I'm told they sell out of bread every day. Also, as I tell you, on College Street, same block, past Borden Street, one city block south, a bread line. Line up of people waiting in the cold for food. But this one's a food bank. These are people who are waiting for basic staples. And I'm told that they also run out of food and can't keep up with demand. I mean, you, you could try to look at it positively, like... We try to create multi-use neighborhoods in Toronto where people from different socioeconomic backgrounds live together in harmony. Uh, that's nice. But come on, like, we know what this really is. This is, like, visual proof every day that I can't ignore of wealth inequity. And the lineups seem to get bigger at both of those places every day. You just can't ignore it, especially now that it's the holidays. I mean, this is the one time of the year when everybody makes a point of not ignoring it. Turn on the TV or the radio or go online and you will inevitably be hit with ads telling you that this is the season of giving and it's time to donate to a food drive. Hello, Mississauga. Mayor Bonnie Crombie here. There is no doubt in my mind that we are the most compassionate and generous community in Canada. Hi, I'm Nahim Denshi, Mayor of Calgary. This year's annual 
Mayor's Food Bank Drive. I'm here dropping off some much needed food donations. Please consider going through your pantry or picking up a few extra items. Tackling hunger in Canada starts with one red bag. Loblaw stores across the city are hosting an annual holiday food drive. Sobeys across Canada, we're a Canadian company, been around for over 100 years, and we're a food store helping food banks. It's a natural tie-in. So fill a bag and let's tackle hunger. We've talked a little bit about food banks before on this show. It's the least controversial thing. Feed the hungry. Conservative politicians, liberal politicians, NDP politicians, banks, broadcasters, grocery stores, everyone is united in this. Loblaws, Metro, Sobeys, CBC, TD Bank Group, Scotiabank, CIBC, RBC, Quest Trade, Canadian Pacific Railway, BC Dairy, Walmart, General Mills, Kellogg's, Campbell, Sun Life, Save on Food, CBC, Dollarama, Tim Hortons, Home Depot, Global News, Bell Media, Egg Farmers of Canada, PepsiCo, Premier Doug Ford, former Premier Jason Kenney, former Premier John Horgan, Premier Francois Legault, Premier Blaine Higgs, pretty much every single mayor of every single Canadian city. Crate and Barrel, American Eagle Outfitters, Swiss Chalet, Amazon, 7-Eleven, Molson Coors Canada, Kettle One Vodka, SSP Canada, for every Tito's Vodka Bloody Caesar that you order at a participating SSP airport, bar, or restaurant, a donation will be made to Food Banks Canada. They're all involved, all of the above, to varying degrees, wildly varying degrees, in food drives or food banks. It is the food bank industrial complex, people. Some of these institutions give money directly to food banks. Some host annual food drives. And I get it. I mean, it makes sense. Like, what could be an easier form of charity? You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to give them your email address. You don't have to mess around with tax receipts. Just throw a couple of cans of food into a bin as you're headed out of the grocery store and you've done a good thing. With all of the promotion of food banks from virtually every institution and elected official in the country, given how unanimous this is, I mean, this is like, without question, the most visible, the most highly promoted solution to hunger that you will find, you might conclude that this is also a very good solution to hunger. But it's not. In fact, food banks were never meant to be. You might imagine that they have been here forever because, I don't know, they they conjure up like old cartoons of hobos being fed in soup kitchens or whatever. But the fact is, food banks are relatively new in Canada. They were introduced in the 80s as a last-ditch emergency effort. And they were never meant to stick around, much less play a permanent role in keeping needy people fed. But somehow, they have been normalized and corporatized, while other possible solutions, perhaps better solutions, are going ignored. This is not normal in other places, but food banks are the way it is in Canada. Today, reporter Cherie Sucherin is here with the truth about food banks. Wait for it. How does it work if I need to go to a food bank? Okay, so if you go to a food bank, it varies wildly depending on the food bank. So there's some food banks where you show up and and they give you a bag or a box of food. There's other programs where you do have to sort of submit some sort of information just to say who you are, why you're there. And then, like, the actual process of getting food can also vary wildly depending on the food bank. There's a lot where, you know, you line up, you walk in, and it's kind of sort of like a grocery store. And so there's, like, stuff on shelves, and you can pick what you want. Um, There's other programs where they kind of sort things into boxes. So you'll get a box that has, like, some pasta or meat or flour or whatever, just some basics. So it really depends on where you go. But generally, you go to a food bank, you can expect to get some type of food. Right. And I have to wonder, like, you know, sometimes it's like you clean out the closet of all the old, like, lima beans and things that you, like, haven't used and aren't going to use. And that's what you give away. Yeah. So is that what people are getting? Are they getting just, like, rando weird stuff that has been sitting in somebody's cupboard for years? Or, or are they getting, like... Staple food to feed your family. Well, generally, it's good quality food, but there are some food banks that have actually had issues of people donating expired stuff. 
So Parkdale Food Bank in Toronto actually did a campaign where they'd found this like 14-year-old can of soup someone had donated to them, and they had a volunteer pledge to eat it if they had reached their fundraising goal for the year. In preparation for eating 14-year-old soup, I figured I'd do some stomach training. It was about a month old. So I guess they're, they're making do with the donations they get, but also buy staples based on the funds that they have. Oh, they buy food. They do buy food. A lot of food banks buy food. So when they get cash donations, and a lot of food banks will actually request cash donations versus food because what they can do is buy more with their money. They have special setups with grocery stores and food suppliers. I would hope they get the best deal anyone could get. They get the best deal. And also they could buy things that people actually not only need but will eat because if you're giving people like the stuff that nobody else wanted, some of it won't get actually eaten, I guess. Exactly. And a lot of grocery stores have deals with Second Harvest and other like food rescue organizations. I went to the Parkdale Community Food Bank right here in Toronto and I met up with Kitty Raman Costa, who's the executive director there. Hi. Hi, Kitty. I'm sure you... Hi, nice to meet you. It's a pretty small space. It's located in a few rooms in the basement of this building in Parkdale. Um, there's some outreach upstairs, but most of it is in the downstairs part. There's sort of stacks of food piled up everywhere and a couple of freezers. Um, but it's a pretty small place for the number of people that they serve. So this is where our volunteers pack up all the grocery boxes. And then we have like the dairy products. And we have like usually yogurt and cottage cheese and different stuff like that. So it's like a wide variety of stuff. And we don't just give like pantry stuff, like we give fresh food too. And then we have a freezer here too. And this is where we would usually store like meat. Our freezers are, yeah, so it's really cold, but it's all, um, it's like some frozen bread. And then you can see there's like some meat and hot dogs and chicken and stuff like that. So it's like. Tons of freezer stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like you wouldn't expect it to be, but I feel like it's, it's a lot of stuff here for like such a small space. Yeah, so the small space is probably... And we got to talking about how there's been a huge increase in the need for food over the past few months. I, I'm curious, like, are you able to, like, meet demand so far? Not at this moment, honestly. We have been in the past, but over the past, like, six, five to six months, our client base has uh, really increased significantly, so... Um, prior to the pandemic, we served about 1,000 to 1,500 families every month, and that was really manageable. And then during the pandemic, our client base raised to four to 6,000 people like every month, which became like really difficult um, to manage, but it was still more manageable than now. We're serving about 8,000 families every month, um, and that's really increased in like the past four to six months. That's crazy. So that's been really challenging for us to keep up with. And our biggest issue is that we actually can't, like, store enough food to give them. So, like, you can see the space is really small. And, like, we try to pack it with as much food as we possibly can. But we actually can't, like, store enough food to provide the what we need to provide to, like, all of our families in our community. And it's just really challenging. Right. That's no, been our biggest sure. challenge. Um, so we don't receive government funding, um, but we do sometimes receive grants that we apply for. Like almost all donations from community members and like different businesses. And grants usually fund specific projects. So for example, our delivery program was funded by a grant through the United Way. I just want to repeat what Kitty said to me, that this small community food bank is serving over 8,000 families in Toronto. And that's up from 2,500 families at most before the pandemic. So it's, it's a huge number they're serving. And they rely mostly on donations of food or cash from the public or food from other sources like grocery chains. A lot of the granting that they relied on before during the pandemic has dried up. And then she told me something really interesting. I mean, I think if there was a perfect world where, like, everyone can meet their own needs and, like, everyone can, like, purchase food and it's affordable and everyone has, like, enough money to purchase food, like, no, I don't think food banks should exist. Wow. So the executive director of a major food bank in Toronto does not want it to exist. Yeah. But that's actually not an unusual perspective, as it turns out, because... Kitty and a lot of other food experts have told me that the more food banks we have for people to depend on, the less responsibility the government has to actually ensure people have food. So how did we get here? So, you know, I think a lot of Canadians seem to have this belief that food banks were always around 
and that it's always just been a thing that um, they exist and you donate to them and it's a good thing. And that's actually really not true at all. So the first food bank in Canada actually started up in 1981, and it was a food bank in Edmonton. And what had been happening at the time was that this was like the 1980s recession had just started. Unemployment was super high. I think it was at 13 percent, which is wild. And there was also sort of a crisis in food commodities worldwide. So the price of, of food was really expensive. In the U.S., this sort of food bank model had started. And so a lot of small community churches, that type of thing, saw that model and were like, OK, we're going to try this just as a temporary measure to feed people who were, you know, unemployed, couldn't find work or couldn't afford food. It's like a perfect storm of factors where there was like all of a sudden in an otherwise, you know, comfortable nation, nobody's got money and there's no food to be had and you just got to get food on people's plates. Exactly. And, you know, this was generally thought of as like, this is not going to be forever. It's going to be temporary. So what happened is more and more people in Canada needed food banks and those communities, they started creating them to meet that need. And they just sort of started proliferating across the country. And it was actually in 1989, Ed Broadbent said in the House of Commons that there were more food banks in Canada than there were McDonald's restaurants. Holy shit. So during the 1980s, not only were food banks everywhere at that point, and not only was the need so great that they had to be everywhere, but they had actually started running out of food. So, for example, in 1985, there was this food bank in Victoria that was so in demand, they decided to stop serving single men. Problem is, the food bank doesn't have enough food to go around. Single males are best able to fend for themselves, and after August 1st, they're going to have to. And food bank use is actually the highest it has ever been in Canada. This is according to Food Banks Canada. They recently released their annual survey of almost 5,000 food banks across Canada. And they found that in March of 2022, food bank use was actually up 35% compared to just three years before that, so before the pandemic. There were 1.5 million visits to food banks just in that month alone. I have to ask this because food has gotten so damn expensive. Like from what you're telling me, some of these food banks say, like, we'll give you three days worth of food. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can go to any grocery store and buy three days worth of food for a family and spend less than 30, 40, 50 bucks. So if they're just giving away $50 worth of stuff, they don't do anything to see if you really need it? They do try to lower what they call barriers to access, which means that any kind of barrier in place that makes it harder for someone to access a food bank or more difficult will mean that less and less people will access it when they need it. So their main thing is that the less barriers or steps you have to go through, the more people will get it when they need it. And so, yeah, this, the hypothetical that maybe some people that don't need it are going and getting, I don't know, 40, 50 bucks worth of food from a food bank. But I think even if there's a small percentage that are mooching off the system, it's still worth it because more people that actually need it will get it. So you got these two negative outcomes. One is like, okay, maybe somebody scams us or exploits this in some way or resells it or something. Another negative outcome is that somebody who really needs it doesn't use it because it's yes, embarrassing think- or because it's stigmatized or shameful. And they're like, we're much more worried about people not using it than people misusing it. Absolutely. And I think there's a general understanding that that is worse than like, I don't know, 1% of users going there that who don't really need it. Okay, so I guess it's good that we don't, like, force people to somehow demonstrate that they're, like, actually hungry. (laughs) That would be ridiculous, and I don't even know how that would work. I think the main thing is that it's not about hunger at all. It's actually about this concept called food insecurity. And what that actually means is someone can be food insecure when they are able to buy food still, but they're not able to buy all the food that they need or the nutritious food that they actually would need to sort of live a healthy life. So a lot of things that people find when they're looking at food insecurity is that, you know, there are a lot of Canadians that they can buy, you know, the cheaper bread or the cheaper pasta, but they can't buy meat. 
to get protein or they can't buy some of the more expensive vegetables. So I actually got in touch with Dr. Valerie Tarasuk, who is the principal investigator for this program called Proof, which is a research program out of U of T that studies household food insecurity. When we monitor food insecurity in Canada, we do it using a standardized, you know, highly validated set of questions that range in severity from the first question being, do you ever worry about running out of food and not having money to get more food because you don't have enough money? So the first question, do you ever worry about being without food and not being able to afford to buy more? But then the majority of these 18 questions are picking up quantitative deprivation. So skipping meals, cutting the size of meals, going hungry without eating, losing weight, at its most extreme, going whole days without eating because of a lack of food or money for food. So to summarize that spectrum of experiences, what we are talking about, at least in proof when we use the term food insecurity, is inadequate access to food because of financial constraints. Okay, fair enough. But whether you call it feeding the hungry or providing security to the food insecure, what could possibly be wrong with doing that through a food bank? I think the idea is that it, food banks aren't wrong. But the problem is that if you're at the point of needing one, so many other things have failed where they should have succeeded. We have so many opportunities to create policy to prevent people from being food insecure that we simply haven't. A part of me just wants to stand on a platform someplace and scream because I'm thinking, well, if that was a solution, we've been doing it for like 40 years. So we talk about, you know, solutions to food insecurity. So time and time again, we know that food insecurity happens because people don't have enough income, basically. It's all to do with income. So she said that the 5.8 million people in Canada who are food insecure are mostly from these three lower income groups. So people in lower wage jobs, people on social assistance like disability benefits, and families with children. So over half of this problem is sitting in the workforce. And that's people who are working but still unable to make ends meet. The other group that is extremely, extremely vulnerable to food insecurity are people who are on social assistance. But In most parts of this country, that is almost a direct sentence to food insecurity because the benefit levels are so inadequate. And again, you know, this is something that we've known since the 90s. Note that I'm not mentioning anything about seniors or pensioners, and that's because there's a lot of data in Canada suggesting that one of the most effective social programs we have is our old age pensions. And there's a very famous study in our field that um, was done a few years ago by a group at the University of Calgary that shows low-income, unattached individuals in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. And they showed this dramatic drop in the probability of food insecurity when people hit 65. Why? Because then they're entitled to absolute income security with the old age pension and guaranteed income supplement. That Those income sources are indexed to inflation, which in most parts of the country, social assistance isn't. And that's just rational, right? Like if you're making $15 an hour, But I don't know, the lineups look long, but let's say you can get in and out of there in 30 or 40 minutes and you're getting $20, $30, $40 worth of food. As a pure rational decision, you should be doing that if you can, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the reality of a lot of the like minimum wage work or gig work is that not all of your hours are accounted for. You're probably working shifts. So whenever you're on your off time, you can go to the food bank. So there's a huge push to increase minimum wage, increase benefits, increase those kinds of things. The other group that experiences lower incomes are people on social assistance. So we're talking about people that rely on things like ODSB or other types of provincial disability benefits. And those are all shown to be drastically low in most parts of Canada. And we know that amount is low because if you remember during the pandemic, people got CERB and that was $2,000 per month. The maximum disability benefit in most provinces doesn't go higher than 1500 with most people receiving less per month. I don't think there's any province in which it goes up to 2000 So we know people need 2000 at least to live, and the government doesn't even give them that. And if you've got like a completely fixed income like that, then this is a way to actually make ends meet yes. or, or, or get closer to doing Absolutely. so. Absolutely. And the third group that experiences lower income is families with children. The mere fact that a household contains someone in it 
under the age of 18 is enough for the probability, the risk of food insecurity increases. So just simply having a child in a household is enough to increase the risk of food insecurity for that household. And that is ridiculous, right? And Teresa explains that there's actually a pretty big health cost to long-term food insecurity. People who are food insecure are more likely to develop type 2 diabetes or an anxiety disorder. They're actually much more likely than food secure adults to end up in our system being treated for mental health problems. And this is actually even more true for children who are more likely to be diagnosed with depression or suicidal ideation if they grew up food insecure. In the whole spectrum of you know diagnostic categories that would be associated with hospitalization in Canada, the only one where we don't see a difference between the food insecure and the food secure is cancers. Cancer appears to be the great leveler in our society. It's it's sickening to say that, but that's the only type of condition. And what's interesting is that a lot of people talk about solutions to that being like child tax benefits or lower sort of like the universal daycare programs. So those things are also um, a really big deal. And one thing that might solve all of those problems is universal basic income, which is a program that a lot of people in food insecurity talk about as being a potential like problem solver across the board. So all of those things are different ways of giving people money. Basically, yeah. That explains to me why it's kind of ridiculous for a Justin Trudeau or a Doug Ford to make a big deal about volunteering at a food bank or visiting a food bank and, and urging everybody to donate to a food bank. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. What a pleasure to be here today with all these incredible young people who've uh, chosen to spend part of their day filling hampers uh, and making sure that everyone has a happy Thanksgiving. Because essentially what they're saying is, I've fucked up and I haven't given people the basic needs that we expect governments to do. And, And some of this I know some people feel like that's something the social safety net should exist and some people think it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But we have determined that like food for children is a basic human right. So for a a politician to say, I need you to donate a can of soup is an egregious admission of failure that is, I guess, presented as a almost like um, they're doing the right thing and you should too. Yes. I think that's definitely what the message is. It's like, you know, you hear Justin Trudeau saying, you know, everyone's got to pitch in. And it's like, well, what about you? The last few months have been hard, and on this Canada Day, we need to continue to be there for each other. Something interesting is that in 1989, the House of Commons agreed on a resolution that they would eliminate child poverty by 2000, and they did not. The statistic is now one in five children live in poverty, so that clearly did not work. There are formal commitments that have not been kept that that have failed. Yeah. And we also signed onto the UN Declaration of Human Rights Charter, which makes food a human right. This is Jade Guthrie. She's a community organizer for Food Share in Toronto. And she says part of the problem of how we think about food security in Canada is that it's from the perspective of food as a commodity instead of a right. We've heard from people who access food banks that often they're made to feel like they should be like grateful or indebted to the people at this food bank, you know, whether it's the volunteers or the folks running it, for giving them that food that day, right? It's very much rooted in these, like, Christian white savior narratives that it comes out of. But I think if we're talking about what a food just or an equitable food system looks like in the future, um, what we need is to shift away from this idea of food as a commodity and towards food as a human right. I don't think that the government has done anything to advance the right to food for people living in Canada. I think the fact that they've invested so much money in a food banking system um, only goes to show that they are not interested in framing food as a human right. Food banking is very much like a temporary band-aid solution to the issue of food insecurity across the country. All right. That explains a rejection of government's posturing and performance in this space. But from the point of view of everybody else, they don't control whether or not the government raises the minimum wage. No. So can they not say, look, we don't set policy in this country, but we do want to give back and we do want to help. And that's why we've chosen food banks. That's why Loblaws has chosen food banks. Like, what's the problem with a Loblaws 
choosing that as a main way they demonstrate corporate responsibility and, you know, give back to the communities that they serve, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I think on its face, it seems really natural. Like, you're a grocery store. You have extra food. You can give away the extra food. It's on brand. On brand. They got the food right there. Makes sense. So there's this researcher at York University, Dennis Raphael, who has been looking into this cozy relationship between grocery store chains and food banks. So we actually start looking at Walmart, which promotes a big food drive every holiday. And some people might remember Walmart has this sort of bad reputation as a low-wage employer. What Rayfield found was that he saw how Walmart seemed to have completely revamped their reputation based on this anti-hunger campaign. I used to type in poverty in Walmart to give them an example of uh, the literature out there documenting how corporations such as Walmart have had a really profound negative effect on the quality of life of many Canadians. So, oh, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, I uh, went on sabbatical, came back a year later, I was teaching the course, and when I typed in Walmart and poverty, what came up literally were tens and dozens of uh, websites showing how Walmart had become a champion of fighting hunger in Canada by making donations to food banks. The Walmart Fight Hunger Spark Change campaign is raising awareness for the need for emergency food in our community. Well, first of all, you, you know it's an incredibly profitable corporation. So number one is they provide minimal wages and benefits. Uh, many Walmart workers actually use food banks. So number one, it's not a great employer. Number two, uh, they have this incredible anti-union reputation. But what we discovered at the time was that Food Banks Canada, the largest food bank organization in Canada, had partnered with Walmart. And in the process, not only had they entered into a partnership, but one of the vice presidents of Walmart was now sitting on its board of directors. And we did a study where we basically said, well, uh, not only Walmart, but there are other corporations sitting on the board. And we did a careful review of all of Food Banks Canada's documents, and not surprisingly, we never found a mention of how unionization would increase wages and, of course, reduce food insecurity. And uh, we published that, and then we did a follow-up where we went back and said, let's look at the board of directors of four major food bank and food diversion. And it was Food Banks Canada, it was Daily Bread Food Bank, uh, the National Zero Waste uh, Association, and Second Harvest. And by the time we did the second paper, we discovered that this vice president of Walmart had now uh, been promoted to being the chair of the board of directors of uh, Food Banks Canada. Like other major corporations that are associated with the Business Council of Canada, they have, over the last few decades, been very successful in lobbying and pressuring governments to uh, reduce taxes on the wealthy and on corporations. What was it? Paul Martin reduced taxes on corporations by $100 billion. Flaherty did it by, I believe, $60 billion. And uh, the corporate sector has been very successful in shrinking the Canadian welfare state. Let's look at Loblaws, because there's a number of problems with Loblaws. And number one is the fact that they fix the price of bread. And we know this because they had to give every Canadian a $25 gift card, which is crazy when you consider that they fixed the price of bread. For years and years, in collusion with other major grocery stores. In collusion with other major grocery stores. So they're literally colluding to raise the price of food for Canadians. They fixed prices for 14 years. And what was the penalty? They gave out gift cards to people. They gave out $25 gift cards. And I said, imagine that you walked into Loblaws and you grabbed a loaf of bread and you ran out with it. Do you think that you'd be treated as easily as Loblaws has been? Another thing that they did, if you remember during the pandemic, is they created this thing called Hero Pay, and they gave all of their workers an extra $2 an hour. But what happened was that that ended pretty quickly in June 2020. 
And I learned on Commons that they did that also in collusion with other grocers. Like, they all ended it at the same time. Yeah, Sobeys, Loblaws, and Metro all ended it at the same time, and then several other grocery chains followed suit a few months later. I mean, we were still in the pandemic, and, you know, there's still COVID. It's still happening. So I don't see how they're uh, less heroes than they were before. And the third thing is that, um, I don't know if you've seen the commercials lately, but Loblaws are going on about how they're freezing prices because of inflation. Yay. Loblaw is freezing prices on all items under its black and yellow no-name label. Some of the products include apples, potatoes, butter, eggs, cheese, rice. But what's actually happening is that they jacked up their prices just a few months ago. So they're now locking in their jacked up prices during inflation. And those price jacks were in excess of the rate of inflation. Yes, there was actually a study that showed in March 2022, grocery store prices had gone up more than the rate of inflation in Canada. They took advantage of the fact that we were used to prices shooting up to like just get a little bit extra on top. Exactly. And then they locked that in and said, this is a gift. Yeah, yeah. And then they ask you, after you check out, to put some of the food that you bought from them into a bin, you should donate. Yes, exactly, which is actually really- You should pay them for the food with their jacked up profit margin, and then you should give it away. They want you to do that so that you're a nice guy. They want you to do that, and the thing is that because they know that food banks can actually buy food from grocery stores or wholesalers at a much lower level. So, for example, like I might buy a can of corn for $2, but a food bank can probably get it for $0.10. Cents. If you take your $10, instead of spending it at Loblaws and then throwing it in the bin, uh, you can just give that money directly to a food bank and that would go way further. Oh, it's interesting. I mean, thinking about the dynamics that, like, a better world would demand of these various power brokers here, what would the dynamic be between the politicians and the grocers? Like, you would hope that if the grocers are acting egregiously in this way, then the politicians would have a role there and they'd be in contention with each other. And you would hope that the politicians would be being held accountable by the public to promises that they've made about, you know, basic food for children and whatnot and child poverty. But instead, they both are sort of occupying a position of like we are in lockstep in agreement as establishment figures that um, food banks are great and we support them and you should too and you need to do your part too. So they're kind of like, you know, kind of united there. Yeah, you would hope that there would be some tension between these sort of big corporate producers and the government, but that's not what we're seeing. We're actually seeing them kind of a shout out each other, high five each other um, in 2020. We see Doug Ford get on television and give a shout out to Kraft Heinz for what they call their Kraft Heinz Pantry Day. And so they'd just given a massive donation to a food bank. I want to give a special shout out to Bruno Keller, president of Kraft Heinz Canada. They're committing $20 million. I'm going to repeat that. That's, that's a big change there. $20 million over five years to Food Banks Canada. This is great news. Thank you, Bruno. You can support the campaign by picking up Kraft Heinz products at the grocery store. I guess as I come to understand what you're saying, it's not an argument against food banks. It's more that like we should be embarrassed that we need them instead of everybody being so comfortable and congratulatory and accepting of them as like the normal way to deal with this. Can we compare that? Like if this is a uniquely Canadian thing, that was supposed to be a temporary measure but has become normalized over the years. What's the other path? You know, what I didn't realize and what was really surprising to me looking into this is that researchers say that Canada is unique in this. And they actually compare Canada to the U.S. and the U.K. Because in the U.S., there are specific programs and policies that are meant to reduce food insecurity. And here again is Dr. Valerie Tarasuk. I've done work, you know, looking at food insecurity in other countries. Canada is unique in this regard. You know, there are food banks for sure in the United States and in the United Kingdom. And, you know, they're, they're moving along in Europe, I believe. But from what I can figure out, we're the only country that continues to have this craziness where we've got, you know, our, our prime minister and our provincial premiers doing photo ops over Thanksgiving at food banks. And I'm sure we'll see that again at Christmas time. She said you wouldn't see Joe Biden doing that because in the U.S. there seems to be this understanding that the need for food banks is not a good thing. So, for example, they have something called SNAP, where if you're a lower income person, you can get a voucher and spend it at a grocery store or a farmer's market. 
or other places, and they're specifically meant for people to get more nutritious food. Is this food stamps? Basically, what we know is food stamps. And what's actually interesting is Canada is the only G7 country without a school food program. The Liberals actually started some sort of process of consultation to get that going, a federal school program, but that only started like two weeks ago. That is wildly divergent from my presumption about the difference between Canada and America. Like, even with my jaded view about Canada, I figured that we have better social safety net than they do. And it's such a sad story because it's like from the best possible intentions and people at a community grassroots level, just like people need this, so let's do it. And it proliferates and then it becomes establishment and it becomes like the go-to place, the safest place. Like a lot of charities aren't safe. You know, you, you don't want to back the wrong charity. But this one seems like it's become the safe harbor for like I don't care if you're selling vodka or vegetables or if you're selling mutual funds. Almost everybody in corporate Canada seems to be in on the food bank, food drive thing. And then it gets to be so mainstream that the media is all in. Yeah. So CBC, uh, across the country, CBC bureaus uh, run their food bank day. I think this year it's uh, December 2nd. Tune in to CBC on December 2nd for our annual Food Bank Day, a full day of special programming, giving, and community. This is like sort of the happiest day of the, like, it's sort of when there's a break from the usual, like, war and bad news. Yeah, they have a concert on that day. It's like a community and it's it's music. Holidays. Sounds of the season, right? Sounds of the season. That's what it's called. CBC has that. We also have Bell Media, which uh, they've hosted these sort of like 12-hour broadcasts in support of food banks. Post Media also encourages people to donate Rogers, um, donating to food banks. So you see like a, a pretty big agreement between media companies across Canada that food banks are good. You should donate to them. And I guess the point is not that that's a bad thing. Like that's great that people give that food. But it does make it complicated for those same media companies to aggressively interrogate how fucking normal this has become. Absolutely, especially when you see these, like, big partnerships with large food banks, like, for example, Daily Harvest. And so how do you report on food security issues in Canada when that sort of partnership is so embedded? It's just a lot easier for uh, CBC to have a food drive than have a universal basic income drive. I mean, that's like, that's political. They're not going to do that. Exactly. And I think that's also a good point. Food banks are depoliticized. Like, you can be conservative, you can be a liberal, and, you know, food banks are still good. You're not making a statement by donating to a food bank. Can I admit something, though? Like, Sure. (laughs) As cynical as... This conversation might make me about, like, we're doing the wrong thing and there is a right thing. I'm still totally flummoxed as to how you would go about the right thing with the same apparatus because it seems like a non-starter for all of those different vectors of society, all those different institutions, organizations, companies, uh, politicians, to align on a political agenda the same way that it is totally safe for them to align on food banks. So we could say that this is like a bad conclusion to land on, and we could say that this is normalizing something that shouldn't exist. But if we're actually talking about like how to make things better, we can articulate the goal, but the process is still a total mystery. My takeaway from this and from talking to experts and people is that the solutions don't necessarily have to be political. And in fact, we've known about these solutions for over four decades. So for four decades... There's been research that shows there's high levels of food insecurity. There's research that shows that food banks aren't the solution to it. And research that shows that somehow getting higher incomes for Canadians would be a solution to that. And none of this needs to be a political process. Or it doesn't need to be a a political standpoint to say, hey, if we raise income, people will be less food insecure and more healthy. And not have to go to the hospital, not have to go to the doctor. They can live longer lives. Kids will be more secure, all of those things. And so I think if we look at it through a lens of health outcomes versus this sort of political social safety net drama, then we can actually get 
somewhere. A rationalist, even like an economic, like you can make arguments based on educational outcomes, you need food. Economic outcomes, you need food. And health outcomes, food insecure people get way more sick and cost the system much more money. This is about fact and reason and what goes in on one side and what comes out on the other. Exactly. And the thing is, like, largely there isn't, like, a single policy that, you know, all of the food people are are trying to advocate for. It's simply the fact that you raise income and you raise levels of food security. And, And however that happens is generally seen as a good thing. Even if you took the same amount of resource and rededicated it to universal basic income or something like that, it would have a more profound impact on this than putting all that resource into the food bank food drive system. Exactly, because what we're looking at is, like, do we want to solve a long-term problem or solve a short-term problem? We want to solve a short-term problem every time, every year. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And, I mean, we're looking at Justin Trudeau, who just pledged $100 million, I think, in in 2021 to go to food banks. This is during the pandemic. And earlier that year, he'd also pledged an original $100 million to go to food banks. So we just spent $200 million to not solve a problem. Thanks, Cherise. Thanks. All right. Well, this is something new for us. If you made it this far, uh, maybe it's working. We have been making podcasts for over 10 years, but video is something new. If you want us to keep doing it, hit subscribe to this channel. It will make a difference. You also might want to hit subscribe to our main channel, and we're going to be posting videos there, exclusive content that we are not putting anywhere else. Also, Canada Land is a audience-supported news organization. We need people to support us directly, and we have an incredible membership program. You'll get ad-free versions of all of our podcasts. You'll get discounts and exclusive access to our merchandise. You'll get invites and early access and discounts to our live and virtual events. More than anything else, you will be keeping journalism alive in this country. To help us out, and we rely on it, go to canadaland.com slash join.